simply acting on our natural desires or inclinations as they come over us will not lead to stable society. I can't help but notice uh, the third reason, paragraph nine there. It says also that these creatures, having not as man the use of reason, do not see, nor think they see, any fault in the administration of their own common business. Whereas amongst men, there are many, very many that think themselves wiser and abler to govern the public, better than the rest. And these troublemakers strive to reform and innovate one this way, another that way, and thereby bring it into distraction and civil war. So rather than obediently following what the leaders of the society or the sovereign says, human beings, unfortunately, have this nasty tendency of using their own reason to try to figure out for themselves how things should go, and often will disagree with what the sovereign says, and challenge and question that, and this leads to disintegration. So we need to keep that from happening prevent people from using their own reason to challenge what the, uh, the judgment of the sovereign is. And one more I want you to note. Look at the bottom of 108, paragraph 11. He says that, fifthly, irrational creatures, <coughs> or mere animals, cannot distinguish between injury and damage. So injury, sorry, I'll continue. And therefore, as long as they be at ease, they are not offended with their fellows. Whereas man is then most troublesome when he is most at ease. Um, so the distinction between what he's calling here injury and damage, I think is something like the following. It's not entirely clear, but I think it's something like the following. Um, when we are injured, we blame someone else. So when we are injured, we attribute the cause of that injury to the choice that somebody else made. Someone else is responsible for injuring me. Whereas, if there's damage done to us, we don't hold anybody else responsible. So if I'm struck by lightning, there certainly is damage done to me, but I don't blame anybody for that. If uh, you come up and punch me in the nose, I'm injured, that is, my interests were harmed, but you're, that is, I hold you responsible for that. Okay, so the difference between injury and mere damage <coughs> is whether I blame you, or I blame somebody, I hold somebody responsible for acting contrary to my interests. Okay, and that's going to bring people into conflict with one another. Mere animals don't hold grudges that way. Mere animals, Hobbes is claiming, suffer damage, of course, and sometimes maybe damage caused by other animals, but they don't blame them. Okay, so for all these reasons, we have to take positive steps to create a commonwealth, not simply act on our natural desires as they come over us. And finally, 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 on page, uh, page 109, paragraph 13, here's how it's done. We're going to create a sovereignty. The only way to erect such a common power as may be able to defend them from invasion of foreigners and the injuries of one another, and thereby to secure them in such sort that by their, in their own industry and by the fruits of the earth they may nourish themselves and live contentedly, here's how we do it, is to confer all their power and strength upon one man or upon one assembly of men that may reduce all of their wills by plurality of voices unto one will, which is as much to say as to appoint one man or assembly of men to bear their person 
and everyone to own and acknowledge himself to be the author of whatsoever he that so beareth their person shall act or cause to be acted. Uh, and, and therein to submit their wills, every one to his will, and their judgments to his judgment. Judgments about value, about what's good, what ends to be pursued. This is more than consent or concord, he says. It is a real unity of them all in one and the same person, made by covenant, he says, made by covenant of every man with every man, in such manner as if every man should say to every man, I authorize, authorize, I authorize and give up my right of governing myself to this man, or assembly of men, on this condition, that thou give up thy right to him and authorize all his actions in like manner. This done, he says, once we've done that, we have a commonwealth, um, and all of the individuals who have given up their right and authorized uh, that individual are now subjects, and the one who receives the authorization from everybody else is the sovereign. A few things to notice here. First, uh, the sovereign, as he says a few times here, may be one natural man, one human being, or an assembly of men, a group of natural human beings. The sovereign here is, I say again, the sovereign here is either going to be a natural man, individual human being, or some kind of artificial man, an assembly of more than one human beings who collectively act as sovereign. So we'll come back to worry about that later today. Second point, um, the covenant that we make, who's, who's, who's making this covenant? Well, first of all, it's conditional. Should I emphasize that again? I authorize and give up my right of governing myself to this man or this assembly on this condition that thou give up thy right hand and authorize all his actions in like manner. What's the condition? That everybody else do it too. So everybody is making an agreement with everyone else. Me with you, me with each of you. To give up something or other on the condition that you also give up something. So this isn't a surprise, given what we've seen about the laws of nature. What is it that we give up? On the condition that other people do so as well. Uh, natural liberty to use our own means necessary. Right, and what's, what's that called? Right nature. We give up our right of nature. On the condition that other people do so as well, we give up our right of nature. <coughs> are inalienable. So we're giving up our right of nature on the condition that other people do so as well, to the extent that we can, as much of it as we can. But there's going to be some elements that we retain. The right to defend ourselves when physically attacked. Okay, next point. Now, um, what happens to our right of nature? I'm giving it up on the condition that you'll do so as well. And giving it up, where does it go? We give it to the sovereign. We give it to the sovereign. Okay, so on condition that you do so as well, I'm going to transfer my right of nature, to the extent that I can, to the sovereign. So all of us, to the extent that we can, on the condition that everybody else does also. Transfer our 
right of nature to the sovereign. And what does the sovereign give up? I say it one more time. The covenant he's describing is between different individuals on the condition that the other gives up their right of nature, transfer it to the sovereign, I'm going to be willing to do so as well. So if it works, we all transfer our right of nature to the sovereign. What does the sovereign give up? Where does he give up his right of nature to? So let's think about what the right of nature is. So the right of nature, as I described it, has two parts. What are those two parts? Right. So the way I described it was that, that was like to act on it, but there was another part. Our, our, our right to access all things in nature. That is right. So we can act on the basis of, well, the way I described it, judging for ourselves what is valuable, what's good. So the way I described the right of nature, I, I sort of pulled apart two parts. One was our right to judge for ourselves what's valuable, that was on the basis of our values. And second, I said, our right to act on the basis of that judgment. Okay, okay. well so, both of these parts are supposed to go over to the sovereign. We transfer our right of nature, to the extent that we can, on the condition that everybody else does so as well, over to the sovereign. Well, you need to take seriously both parts of this. So we're giving up our right to judge what's valuable, what ends are to be pursued, to the sovereign. This goes way, way back to the very beginning when Hobbes talked about how controversies can be resolved. And you remember that if there's a sort of practical controversy, the only way this can be done is either to fight it out, as we do in the state of nature, or to appoint a third party's ju judgment that we will rely on as right reason, as being the correct judgment. So this is a sort of artificial construction where we agree to treat someone else's judgment as correct, substituting it for ours. And now here's how I'm saying exactly the same thing. That what we do is agree with one another to transfer our right of nature to a natural human being or to an assembly, whose judgment is going to be ours. That is, whose judgment we substitute for our own. We take the sovereign's judgment about value to be correct instead of our own. And of course, the second part of the right of nature is the right to act on the basis of that judgment. We give that up also. So we take the sovereign's judgment to be correct and to be the basis for our action. Is that clear? I mean, that's what it means to transfer the right of nature to somebody 